is what the government is spending as far as the social sector is concerned, but it is still well below the asking rate. The Niti Aayog believes that the gap still is almost 5% between where we need to be and where we are today in terms of social sector spending. So what role can the private sector play? Neera, let me come to you uh, with that. You've just put out the Dasra report, and while there has been progress, both in terms of being able to raise philanthropic capital as well as CSR spending, FI23, the number stands at what? CSR 23,000 crores. What more needs to be done? What's the positive change that we've seen, but what do you believe needs to be done going forward? So probably we need to do a lot more. If you really look at India, culturally we give a lot, but there isn't much infrastructure to support that giving. So CSR, yes, gives a lot, but what our report also talks about is how powerful family philanthropy is, retail philanthropy is, and in fact that giving can take a lot more risk and can be more innovative. So a big part of what we've been trying to do is can you take some of that innovation and link it with government systems because as you rightly said, they're one of the biggest, deepest pockets and if you can't work through government systems like health and education, a majority of the population isn't going to reach there. So what we saw this year was that more CSR giving that increase came from companies actually meeting the mandate rather yeah. than there actually being growth. But in family philanthropy, interestingly enough, it was the affluent givers, so professionals, folks who have jobs who are giving far more of their net worth than even the ultra high net worth. And first generation wealth creators doing more of the giving. Yes, and they're giving a lot more. Well, they have liquidity events, right? So once these liquidity events happen, we call them the now generation. So the now givers are putting quite a lot of money like the Comet Brothers, Rain Matter, putting into, or even having Ashish here, really putting money into foundations in climate and other kinds of issues that aren't always the traditional health, but more at an intersection. So you're seeing these now generation givers, you're seeing intergenerational, kind of like the panel we had before, Next Generation, is actually wanting to do a lot more in philanthropy and thinking about how they can be more strategic. And I think what's very exciting, and you'll agree with me, Shireen, is that we're seeing women-led philanthropy actually really move the needle. And if we can really get women to do more and be more of the decision makers. So they don't necessarily create the wealth as much. Yeah but they're actually leaning into doing that philanthropy. And our Giving Pie Network, which has about 300 families now, collectively giving 1,000 crores to India, 70% of the, these families are actually women-led, as in they're the ones engaged in the philanthropy. So if I were to ask you, Neera, for one thing that you believe we need to prioritize, both from a private sector perspective, but also from the government's perspective, to create a much more enabling, facilitative environment to encourage more giving. I think we have to have some incentives, right? So I think... Incentives to give more? Yeah, like tax incentives. I think it can help. And I think, you know, we, we need to be able to do that and we need to have more visibility and transparency. So if the government can mandate and we know where giving is going, then we're able to enable that. So I think just having more players and strengthening that ecosystem, I think will really help. Okay, Ashish, I want to come to you now. Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to add a small thing on the giving. I think the incentive that would really help is giving, being able to contribute shares. Because often people take their company public. Mm. Uh, if you donate shares to a foundation or a charity, it has to be liquidated within a year. So I would advocate that, you know, maybe give five years for a longer period of time. That will then enable people to sort of tax-free give their equity, which is the way it happens. Does globally. anyone really want to part with equity for foundational purposes or for giving purposes, Ashish? No, you'd rather, I think it's easier sometimes to give away small amounts of equity than to give away... Money? Cash. Yeah. That's easier, notionally. And two is, if you're getting it pre-tax, you know, giving away your equity before it crystallizes into a capital gain, that makes it easier. Yeah, you know, so, so that's, that's one idea that you've put on the table to create a more facilitative environment for, to encourage giving. But since you did uh, pick up the mic, let me continue that conversation with you, Ashish. And I want to talk about one of the big spaces that requires innovative solutions, innovative thinking, and a lot of capital from the private sector as well, a space that you're uh, deeply involved and engaged with, education. What more do you believe needs to be done, not just at the level of primary education, but more so at the level of higher education, creating universities that people have access to, affordable uh, educational facilities that people have access to? How do we create more Ashoka universities for the country? 
So Ashoka is a non-profit, and I, I can talk about that model later. But I think if we really want quality universities to grow, I think first thing is, I would say let's advocate to allow for profit. You know, right now it's not for profit, and then people find a way to take money out through an infra company, content company, etc. Yeah. Let's make it legit for so university. So destigmatize the idea of for profit for education. Absolutely. And especially for higher education, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you've seen it in the case of Brazil. There are higher education companies that have more than a million students. You know, they've scaled up the university system. So that's one. Two is, I think we need a better quality marker. NIRF is not enough. I think universities should be forced to disclose their placement data, the acceptance data, you know, all the data about the students they get in and the graduations, the outcomes, because often that's the basis on which parents will make decisions. We've seen it with engineering colleges. The worst ones had to shut down. Mm. So for the market to work well, you can't have information asymmetry. So that's a, a second one. And I think a third one for more research universities like Ashoka, we just need more collaborative platforms. Mm. I don't think anybody can do it alone. Some people can, like the Ambani's or Shivnadar. But I think more collaborative platforms come together. And I'm seeing that happen. We'll have 40, 50 Ashoka-type universities in the next decade. In the next decade, 40, 50 Ashoka-type universities? I think so. I think so. Well, that does deserve a round of applause because it is a huge supply mismatch at this point in time and we're seeing Indian students actually having to go outside of India uh, to be able to access quality education, higher education. Vineet Rai, you've been doing this for over two decades now, the idea of uh, bridging some of these inequities. Uh, Assets under management across the Avishkar group of what, about 8,000 crores uh, plus at this point in time. Where do you believe the problem still lies? What do you believe needs to be done to really unleash entrepreneurship for the development sector? Well, so let me actually just phrase 2030 is just a few years away. Sustainable development goals came into being 2015. A world without hunger, poverty, inequity. Brilliant uh, thought process. It's never happened since the time Homo sapiens walking straight. So uh, great vision from the countries. now. Uh, to make it happen, you require $2.5 trillion a year investment for the last 15 years. We lost everything during COVID, so India itself requires close to a trillion dollar investment. Close to a trillion dollar yeah. investment in case we have to change. Uh, total impact investing, despite all our struggle, everything impact investing was born in this country. This country remains the model. I think we are talking about a few hundred billions. That's where we have reached. Globally, impact investing is close to a trillion. Uh, I think what we have done very well in impact investing is we have convinced at least the foreigners that there is something called impact investing and they have started allocating large amounts of capital. Uh, I, we are still struggling to convince uh, Indians to participate in the venture industry. Uh, impact investing is going to be a step from there. Uh, the good thing that has happened in India is that uh, venture industry and impact investing has actually come together, partly because some of the largest uh, uh, enterprises are coming uh, are going to happen in agriculture, water, health, yeah. education, uh, financial inclusion, uh, and that's that's exactly where the new ideas and new initiatives. I'm coming from startup Markum, and uh, uh, the amount of people who uh, the feet footfall that we saw in Agritech was seen to be believed actually, yeah. where you have AI, SaaS, and gaming, gaming competing against Agritech for footfall. So. Well, that, that certainly is impact. We will, we will have to see how this actually plays itself out. But you're right that we do have startups now focusing on India's specific problems and trying to look for Indian uh, ways of being able to address some of those, including what you've been able to do, Shuchin, uh, with your chain of hospitals. Now, explain to me uh, what you've done differently so that you can make quality private health care accessible and affordable. And how do we scale that model? Thank you, Shirin. As we sit here speaking about billions and trillions of dollars, and uh, we were together at an event recently at Davos where the head of a large multinational bank actually mixed up her billions and trillions and yes. said, no, no, I don't really meant trillion, I meant billion. No, no, it was trillions. So when we sit here speaking of that, a silent majority seems to slip through all safety nets. Yeah. And in India, we are speaking about more than 500 million people who have no access to emergency, tertiary, quality healthcare. 
and in healthcare the issue is that the inequalities are not just because of the financial reasons that we speak of at these panels right the inequalities go way beyond that geographical reasons are one of the top reasons right metropolitan cities the nine metros of uh, india have a population of what around 12 13 crores if we take the state capitals as well another 20 crores yeah. so more than 100 crores are staying above out of these cities and they have less than 5% of all super speciality healthcare available so even if you are a 100 crore net worth individual in a small town like sitarganj where we work if you have a heart attack and we were not there at that moment of time there's no saving you those 100 crores cannot save you so we understand that the real need is in these small towns but also poor physical outcomes are just a small part of the outcomes in all poor financial outcomes are real yeah. and they are there for everybody to see more than 40% of all indians and it is difficult to understand sitting in this hall more than 40% of all indians have to either borrow or sell some asset just every hospitalization yeah. every time they are hospitalized they will borrow and more than 25% of them slip below the poverty line at each hospitalization that is more than 6 crore people every year so providing low cost high quality healthcare is something that we have excelled in we have now 22 of these hospitals the setup costs are low we apply the pareto principle ruthlessly we understand that at 20% cost we can deliver 80% of the infrastructure 80% of the outcomes 80% of whatever is needed in yeah. that healthcare region so this is what we've been doing and i think it is real i, I think it's very doable we've we've proved it to the world we've proven the model yes 22 so, hospitals yeah. up and running across india across yeah. north india at this point in time ashish said 40 to 50 ashoka universities over the next 10 decades how many uh, hospitals are you going to be set setting up over the next decade yeah, yeah we shouldn't be less than ashish so 50 <laughs> is the number we should go with as okay. well okay but you know we're talking about safety nets and neera i want to get you to come in on that as well but uh, just a quick point from you uh, suchin before i get neera back in uh, since we're talking about safety nets and we are talking about what the government can do ayushman bharat for instance a scheme marky scheme of the government it is up for review vinod paul committee has been set up by the government to review the ayushman bharat scheme what do you believe needs to be done to recalibrate it if at all today uh, you know people question the reimbursement rates for instance what do you think can be done to make it more robust shirin you know we've been the champions of ayushman bharat ever since it was launched we did the first cardiac procedure in the country uh, under ayushman the first angioplasty was done at our hospitals out of the first 10 hospitals recognized and rewarded by the government four were ours unfortunately the issue still remains as in all ppp partnerships this is a ppp partnership right this is a, the government is always wary and suspicious of the private healthcare or the private providers the private providers are always wary that the government does it really mean what it's saying uh, on the big diocese yeah. uh, payments are delayed due to those suspicions only there's lots of uh, issues between the rates that the private healthcare expects and the rates that the government wants to give yeah. even if we are ready to work at these rates it's a very low margin high volume business so but if you're earning less than 10% margins on those yeah. low rates if the payments come in a year later yeah. then you cannot you know hope to earn any money out of it and that is why hospitals stop uh, these services off and on so like for example in haryana all private hospitals stopped aishman services for a couple of days because their payments had been due for more than one and a half yeah. two years yeah. so if they can you know uh, uh, they've uh, announced the green channel but and, if they can implement it on gaps. the ground yeah yeah mira yeah. you know just on the point of ppp and models that have worked but as uh, shuchin was also pointing out gaps execution gaps remain and to ashish's point about collaboration you know of the 23000 in fi 23 of csr money and that available pool of capital everyone wants to do a little bit of education everyone wants to do a little bit of healthcare but how do you get education or healthcare at scale using that capital through the power of collaboration so in fact in our report we talk quite a lot about we're seeing an increase in collaboration and having more pooled funds alongside with government could accelerate a you know, little bit more innovation. But the challenge, Shireen, is not about is it education or is it, is it health. For example, 12 years we've been running a collaborative for adolescent girls. You can't just chop her into pieces and be like, here's yeah. education, here's health. You have to work on sort of outcomes that might be keeping her in school, making sure she's not getting pregnant, not getting married, 
uh, and you know, is employability, which brings me to, we can have as many hospitals and education and even businesses, but our biggest challenge is actually smoothing this income for a bulk of the country, right? Yeah. Income is just so choppy that if there's some way to smooth that with policies, with schemes, mm. with additional support, because then you're gonna get really that engine for our economic growth. And the biggest challenge, honestly, that we've seen is for girls and women and the most vulnerable. So they often yeah. get invisible. They often don't yeah. get reached out to. And that's where philanthropy plays a role. And that's where collaboratives with philanthropy and pooled capital needs to go to the aspirational districts. It needs to go to the most vulnerable because they need products and services to be subsidized, ultimately. Yeah, Ashish, you know, uh, the, the, the Niti Aayog and Amitabh Khan set up that 100 aspirational districts with a clear focus of being able to try and address uh, the vulnerable. But outside of that, if I would ask you to prioritize, and we were just talking about this, prioritizing growth, but more importantly, equitable growth, job-creating growth, what is it that you would like to see now in terms of policy changes, policy interventions? Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, whatever philanthropy does will be very small. Um, the state needs to come up with policies and crowd in private capital to make it happen. And we need to focus on labor-intensive growth. We need to prioritize sectors where lots of jobs get created. Uh, so I would say a few things. One is the investment to GDP has already gone up, public investment. It needs to go up further because we need much better infrastructure in order to be competitive from a manufacturing standpoint. Mm -hmm. Two is we need more industrial incentive we have PLI, which is a good start. I think we need an ELI, employment-linked in incentive, particularly for, and we need to pick sectors like garments, yeah. like uh, woodwork, furniture making, toys, all the labor-intensive sectors which create lots of jobs and provide the right set of incentives for people to kickstart uh, 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 companies in those areas and to grow them. Third is we need an exports mission. Because China captured anywhere from 30 to 50% global market share in all labor-intensive manufacturing from an export standpoint. This is a golden opportunity for India because China is blacklisted now. And uh, this will he yield huge results in terms of job creation. So my focus would be more on how does one accelerate growth, mm. but accelerate growth in a manner that actually creates lots of jobs. Because yeah. that's ultimately the way out of poverty. It's ultimately the way to reduce the Gini index as well, and so therefore reduce inequity. So not a... just PLI, but an ELI as well. And that's, of course, been on the table. Let's see whether the government moves forward. Yeah, Neera. I want to make a plug, Shireen, for the care economy. I yeah. think it can create jobs, and it can really, uh, really, really help women. No, you have my vote on that already. We need much more of the care economy, and that will unlock the potential for women to participate uh, in the economy across the formal as well as the informal sector. But beneath, you know, I want to talk to you about uh, one of the big ideas that you've, of course, also been involved with, the social stock exchange. And in India has seen the first listing on the social stock exchange. You know, take me through what you hope this will do for some of these issues that we've spoken about and for the idea behind impact investors and impact investing. So I think social stock exchange is more on the philanthropy side. So while I was one of the architects, but it's actually worked more for Neera than for me. Uh, having said that, I think uh, what it does is brings the more important parts of transparency and regulation and allowing people or encouraging people to do more philanthropy. I think for social stock exchange, while CSR and other things are already there, uh, maybe we should actually allow temples to invest. And uh, <laughs> I, know, I know there is actually the amount of money that is lying in the temples is actually worthy to go through social stock exchange into the projects that's listed. So Neera, for you, please do look at it. Uh, I am very sure the current government is actually thinking on that line, so do not forget that. Thinking uh, of being able to monetize what's lying with temples? Yeah, yeah, and it's actually global. I have actually gone to Vatican and tried to uh, take money out of them. I realize they don't have much money, but so I've tried everything. But Indian temples are very important, so I think we should use the money productively because the amount of fundi that they receive is significant and make a big difference, probably more than what we do on the CSR. Uh, but if you, if you have to look on the equalization side, on the, on the commercial side, uh, then like carbon credits, uh, where you are pretty much actually trading the arbitrage for growing trees, 
Uh, I think we need to evolve our impact coin. This is actually to address uh, Sushin's. Uh, see, there's no way I will do a startup in Samastipur in Bihar, which I have done, unfortunately. Uh, I will generate a 25% dollar IRR and compete with Rajan Anandan of Peak 15. It's not going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, whatever I do, uh, as an impact investor, I'll do all stupid things. But when I go to the LP, they ask the same returns. Yeah. Now, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand. Samastipur will always be far behind an IIT graduate in Delhi. Uh, or gaming, a guy in gaming will actually yeah. win against a warehousing company. So an impact coin could actually work for Shuchin, for work for me, to push capital to generate returns and then got, get compensated. And that can come from the government. So impact coin is actually the way for the government to think about in creating an equalization for those places where there is going to be a struggle to create value. Well, we've got three concrete ideas. Uh, Ashish, Vineet, and Neera putting three concrete ideas for the next government to consider. Shuchin, wh wh what are you putting down uh, on that list for the next government to consider? Yeah, I think I agree that we need to add another P to the PPP. So it's public-private philanthropy partnerships that we need to make instead of just the public-private partnerships. I think for healthcare and education both, I think it's uh, naive for us to think that the government can just step back and allow the private industry to... No, it avoid. cannot, because yeah, it, it cannot, continues yeah. to do the bulk of this yeah. heavy lifting. Absolutely, yeah. and the government needs to play a very active part. Uh, we've been hearing promises of increased GDP spend on healthcare. We need to see that in action now. I think for the next five years, we need to make very sure. We need to incentivize doctors and providers uh, to go into these aspirational districts, go out of the cosmopolitan cities to set up healthcare facilities. And we need to make sure that we stress on urbanization enough. See, because yeah. just having the hospital there does not really cut it. The doctor has reached the super specialist stage. He's a cardiologist because he studied all his life. He did very well in school. So she needs a good school to be there for her children to study. Yeah. She needs a level of urbanization to relax after work. So all of that has to be pushed across all of these districts to make sure that healthcare goes there as well. You know, Ashish, I'm going to start uh, by asking each one of you for your wrap-up comments, and I'll start with you, Ashish. You know, the one thing that gives you the most hope at this point in time in being able to address and bridge some of these inequities over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and the one thing that you individually, through the various things that you're doing, through Central Square, through Ashoka, and so on and so forth, the one thing that excites you the most? Yeah, I would say what excites me from a country standpoint is that we are on a very solid growth trajectory the next 25 years. I think the real question is, how do we create more jobs? So how do we make sure it's labor-intensive growth? Because that will reduce equity while we accelerate growth. How do we get more investment? How does India's share of export in the world go up dramatically? And how do we move up the value chain? Now, in terms of me personally, my passion really is to build more institutions that really work on these issues alongside government on policy and policy implementation as well. But what's been the biggest learning? Institution building is hard work, Ashish. What has been the biggest learning on, on this journey that you would like to share with us and anyone else who's considering institution building? I think the biggest learning has been, one is partner with others. Nira was also referring to it. Um, it's much better to do it with others than just doing it alone. And two is government is the main actor. Uh, and so one has to work with uh, government. And three is just be innovative. There are new solutions, there are new ways of working. So being in innovative, being outcome oriented uh, is something that we bring from the private sector. Vineet, so you know, what's the thing that you're most excited about? And what's the future as far as the Avishkar group is concerned? What, what, uh, what's driving you today? So we are at around 14,000 crores hopefully to 1 lakh crores uh, by 2030. I actually didn't take into my calculation the COVID. I went from 5,000 rupees to 100 crores in the first 10 years, uh, 150 million, so roughly 1,000 crores in the first 10 years, 1,000 to around 9,000 in the second 10 years. And we said, okay, we'll continue on the same growth, so 1 lakh crore. Then COVID came, so we have stayed, we have slowed down quite. But I think from a, I'm very excited about government thinking differently. I'm very excited about they actually talking about fund of funds. That's a good idea for them to have less control, yet have control. Uh, and allow a uh, thousand other people to more efficiently deploy their capital. So I think uh, I would want to see if the new government comes in, whichever government comes in, to actually uh, announce 
different kinds of funds of fun, which are one lakh crores and not 10,000 crores. I am fairly famous as a beggar, both in Europe and US. Uh, I do not mind being, being famous here for fundraising. Uh, but uh, till 2017, I raised zero in India. In the last five, seven years, I've raised a significant amount of capital in India. I think what has been surprising is the global fund of fund capital now is thinking about raising money in India, which is a big surprise. So that means there is a lot of capital here, which is curious and wants to participate. And government being one of the bigger mobilizer of capital should actually continue to be working on the fund of fund path. So fund of funds and a whole host of fund of funds with a significantly higher outlay. Shuchin, what uh, is the future? What makes you the most excited? What gives you hope and confidence? I truly believe this is India's century. And uh, with the government's focus on healthcare, I think it's organizations like us that are at the really sweet spot. Right, the focus on medical colleges, nursing colleges ensures that the supply side of healthcare will be adequately addressed for us. We will have enough doctors coming out to make sure that they don't just stay in the big cities, they come out to the smaller towns. And the focus on insurance, on making sure that out-of-pocket funds reduce, because we have to yeah. realize that in India, healthcare is not just under-accessed, it is underserved as well. Yeah. Right? The Lancet Commission for Global Surgery said that an LMIC country like ours should have about 5,000 surgeries per 100,000 population per year. And this number can go as high as 23,000 in countries where out-of-pocket spend is negligible and awareness is very high, like the Scandinavian countries. Mm. But if you see in India how many surgeries happened last year, it's just about two, two and a half crores. So that's just 2,000 per uh, 100,000 population. Where are the rest of the 3,000 people? They're not yeah. getting the surgery at all because they don't have enough money or they are not aware. Yeah. That is why all these Guinea's Book of Records come out of India, right? The doctor is standing with the poor girl and they're both very happy. Oh, we removed this 20 kilo tumor. Look at this. This is so nice. But that tumor should have been removed 20 yeah. years ago when it was like a 500 gram tumor, right? Yeah. So this is increasing access and we are getting more patients coming into the hospital. So I think organizations like us are at the real sweet spot and it will be a good time for everyone. Neera, I promised you the first and the last word, so we're going to end with you. What gives you hope and what, gives you, what keeps you excited today? Really special by being able to give the last word because I actually believe and we'll all agree that it is our young people that give us hope, right? Their aspirations and how they really want to see a transformed India. I think we have a collective responsibility to have them achieve those uh, dreams and aspirations and I think we can in our country. I think our biggest challenge, honestly, is patriarchy. <laughs> if we could actually break this patriarchy. Yes, that's, that, that would... does deserve a round of applause. <laughs> but we're also collectively responsible for perpetuating this. But one of our biggest initiatives right now is investing in and really trying to transform women in leadership. And it's yeah. women in leadership in business, philanthropy, development, you know, across the board. But we all have to come on in this together. We all have to come on this together. And each of you have uh, very carefully articulated what the road ahead looks like. It requires all stakeholders to be at the table. And it requires all of us to collectively put our hands together to ensure that we bridge some of these very crucial gaps and inequities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to this panel uh, talking about creating an equitable future for India. Appreciate your time and appreciate your insights. Thank you very much for joining us today. For more news and updates, all you need to do is follow CNBC TV 18 on all of our digital platforms.